Next speaker is my colour panel is 36. I'll grab some water. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> yeah, no, For lots and lots of reasons. So, Terry will be speaking on uh, realizing the promise of conservation. Now, approach Tammy's from the University of Canterbury. Kia ora. Thank you, Peter. Kia ora, everyone. Um, I'm going to do something crazy and ambitious and give a relatively data free talk. There's one slide of data that's come out of my research group and one slide of data that's come out of another research group, but hopefully it'll be abundantly clear why I've done that. Um, but before I do that, I um, just want to give a bit of a, a shout out to my partners in crime. So as you'll soon see, there's a group of us at the University of Canterbury, as well as at uh, Te Punaha Matatini, that are working feverishly away, or when we can find the time, on a, on a, a question that I want to share with you today. And, uh, and also what I want to talk about is to accelerate this conservation genomic approach, well I'll explain what that is. Um, we've got a little bit of money to do it, so thank you very much to uh, the National Science Challenge. So I'll touch just a little bit on what that is going to be, it's very early days. Um, and then also I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that, a Smart Ideas project as well. But as a conservation geneticist, I have to give a shout out to the people who've been funding the kind of work that I do for a really long time, and that's usually conservation trusts. So some of the work that we're doing in this space has been funded by the Mahua Trust and also Brian Mason. And this, and this matters. It will hopefully become abundantly clear. So let's start with a crazy ambitious definition, kindness and science. Now, um, colleagues of mine at, at Canterbury and again at um, uh, Te Punaha Matatini have been thinking quite a bit about what kindness in science is. And this is a working definition, uh, subject to change, and we embrace change in this space. And I'm just, going, I'm just going to read it. So an approach where scientists value diversity and foster support, respect, well-being, and openness in an intergenerational framework leading to long-lasting collaborations and retention of diverse researchers. So you can appreciate why I had to read it, because it's a long definition. But in our view, it's a thoughtful definition. No word is there for, because we like lots of words. Every word has been debated and discussed, sometimes changed, the order changes, new words get put in. So recently we added well-being, and that was following an interview that I did um, about well-being in postgraduate students. So this is our definition, this is our working definition of kindness in science. But we're not actually all that clever, and we're okay with that. We're not the first people to wonder what kindness in science is. And so folks have been talking about it for a good long time, and a, and a real um, famous tweet um, is, is, a, is one of my favorites. So the best advice I got when I entered academia, we're all smart. Distinguish yourself by being kind. Now, and there's a lovely um, uh, president's message in Being Kind by Emily um, Bernhardt that actually talks about this tweet in the context of freshwater ecology research. Now, and that's what really got us started going in this conversation. And I've actually adjusted that tweet just a wee, a wee little bit. And my, what I have in my, uh, in my uh, profile is uh, we're all smart and kind. Don't distinguish yourself by being otherwise. That's the official version because we're among friends here. The unofficial version is don't distinguish yourself by being an asshole. Okay? So we'll stick with the formal version. So. <clears throat> Why does this matter? Why, why are we worrying? Why are we talking about? Why are we excited about kindness and science? Well, that leads us to our crazy and ambitious question. Does embedding kindness and science lead to better outcomes? And it's a question. We haven't got a huge amount of empirical evidence to suggest that this is the case. What we're doing is spending an awful lot of time thinking about how can we actually test this hypothesis? How can we approach this in a way that might be compelling? 
But and again, what we're talking about here is we're not talking about being nice. Nowhere in that definition was the word nice. Being, being kind is fundamentally different. In my research group, we embed kindness in science, we talk about it actively, but we're critical, and um, we have very robust discussions, and we do all of the things that good, clever um, scientists should do. We just do it in a kind way. Now I'm gonna get that water. So why does this matter? Why am I talking about this now? And, and the question really then comes down to, well, if it does lead to better outcomes, should we be talking about it in a larger space? So if this is, this is a, a message that resonates with you, by all means, get in touch, because we are talking about planning a workshop later in the year to actually flesh some of this out. But in the interim, I actually want to use an example, not just talk about kindness, but show how embedding kindness in my own research group has, is, in my view, is leading to better outcomes that I can talk about qualitatively. So I'm not a social scientist, but I'm going to wear that hat apparently today. So we'll put it in the context of the research that I do, so in terms of conservation genetics. So simply put, with conservation genetics, what we want to do is use genetic data to inform conservation management. And if we're thinking about conservation management, we're talking about small, isolated populations of threatened species. So what we have to worry about in the short term is minimizing inbreeding to avoid, in, uh, to avoid inbreeding depression. So we want to avoid that in the short term, but ultimately what we want to do in the long term is minimize the loss of genetic diversity via genetic drift. And the reason why we want to do that is because we want to maintain the evolutionary potential of those threatened species. So we want to make sure that they have the ability, or at least try to make sure they have the ability to adapt to future environmental change. We might think about genetic integrity as well, but I won't be talking about that today. So that's, that's the sort of backstory to conservation genetics. We've been doing it for a few decades now, and we've been doing it with, a, generally speaking, a handful of genetic markers. We've been relying on the, on the, um, the idea that when we look at genetic diversity, for example, at, at, at a few or a handful of genetic markers, hopefully scattered throughout the genome, that it's, this is a good proxy for the overall, overall genome-wide variation in a particular species. But, and, and a lot of it has been because it's the best that we could do. But where the space that we're into now is moving into a conservation genomic space. But it is a space of promise, lots of promise. So to date, there's been over 40 Four zero reviews talking about how awesome conservation genomics is going to be. At the end of 2016, there were only just a few more papers that were actually empirical studies that actually used a conservation genomic approach. So we've got lots and lots of promise, but as of yet, not a lot of um, uh, a lot of evidence that we can actually inform conservation management using a genomic approach. And for here, what I'm going to talk about is, again, is we're using genomic data to inform that management. And what we're thinking about is things like genome-wide variation. Let's maximize genome-wide variation. This is what we want to do. We want to maintain that evolutionary adaptive potential so these small isolated populations can evolve over time. We might want to estimate relatedness, for example, among individuals, so we can make decisions about who to pair with who, because not that surprisingly, we tend to see higher reproductive success among individuals that are less related to one another. And we know that using genetic data or, or genetic markers to estimate relatedness is actually not all that effective in small, isolated populations. So we're moving into a space where we're using tens of thousands of SNPs to estimate these things. So, but really fundamentally, though, is there's the holy grail, this adaptive variation. What is it? Where is it? What does it do? And a lot of that is because for these, these small isolated populations, we're worried about this inbreeding depression. We're worried about this manifestation of, of, of high genetic load, and we want to know how to get rid of it or, or what's actually underlying it. Well, we've got a pretty good idea that it's not just going to be a couple of genes of high effect. It's going to be lots of genes of, of low effect. And so how are we going to find them? How are we going to manage them? It's a really big, big, bold idea to try to go into that space. So 
how do you get there? How do you, how do you move from, from using a conservation genetic approach into a conservation genomic approach? And one review that came out a few years ago coined a term called the conservation genomics gap and basically said there's this big, big um, thing, <laughs> crevasse, <laughs> that we need to get over to jump from conservation genetics to conservation genomics. And in that, in that initial review or that initial opinion piece, what they really attributed that gap to was money. We don't have enough money to jump from genetics to genomics, and we don't actually have the, the capability and capacity to do this. We need the resources, we need uh, the bioinformatic tools to help us bridge that gap. Now, and actually, I will just shout out, so Helen Taylor and crew down at Otago have just come out with a, with a really good paper talking about how you could bridge that gap based on that definition. So if we're thinking about the fact that we need more money, we need more training and resources, how can we achieve that? Now, within my group, we actually look at that gap a little bit differently. For us, we actually think it's a research implementation gap. So how do we partner or work with our conservation managers to affect change. And so how can we do that? How can we, how can we um, better implement the change that we want to see or how can we upskill ourselves um, in that space? And as it turns out, we did a wee bit of thinking and I'll explain how that happened and it relates back to kindness after I drink. we realize that there's folks in our scientific community in New Zealand that have been doing genomics for a really long time. And they're actually asking a lot of the same questions and using a lot of the same tools that we're interested in using it. And they've been doing it a lot longer than we have. So this is an epic literature review that my PhD student Stephanie Gala did that went back from how much? Oh, Jesus. OK, for, see, a lecturer. If anyone was here yesterday, I'm used to 50. <laughs> Sorry, pardon me, that was not okay. Um, <laughs> so super, super quickly, I'm gonna whip up, and we, you basically see a huge exponential increase in the uptake of genomics in primary industry. I did mention this ends at 2005. If we blow in on this, we're actually going on that upward trajectory. So last year we had about 100 papers. I'm sure we're well on to doubling that for 2017. So why do we wanna do that? Um, in part is because we can actually genome enable some of our threatened species. So this has happened for uh, threatened big horned sheep. Often there's, there's species that are both threatened and also commercial. So we can think about it in that space. Um, what's also happening in primary industry is they're starting to realize that small effective population sizes are an issue. And they're starting to ask a lot of the questions that we, that are effectively within our wheelhouse. So basically what we, what we came up with was that actually it's not that we can get all of this expertise from our colleagues in primary industry, it's that there are mutually beneficial advances in both communities and that we can inform how best um, some strategies about how to deal with low effective population size and they can help us through um, some of the things that we want to do. And so the way that we can do that is we can publish a paper, and this is my awesome PhD student who I have to give a huge shout out to. Um, in the space that we do, a little bit of data, Stephanie generated um, in a big hurry for a MapNet meeting recently some related estimates, and they were really kind of low. And that didn't seem right because these were actually family groups and we should have seen a lot of numbers around 0.5. And we were contemplating it and thinking about what that was two days before the conference. And lo and behold, there was actually a, a study or a, a talk on eucalypts um, during that same conference where what Jaroslav actually talked about was that when you've got a lot of missing data, so when you're using a program that doesn't deal with missing data very well, your related estimates are actually artificially low. But when you use a program that actually incorporates missing data, they come up a lot higher. So it's led to lots of really, and this, I, and fundamentally what we say is that this all came out of kindness um, in terms of us working together. I love this one because there's a, a thing called Bioinformatics Anonymous, and this is a blank site on purpose because it's so secret they don't have a logo. Um, and then it also leads into super quickly, 
this project that we've got within um, biological heritage, where we're actually going to be looking for a characterizing adaptive variation in um, some freshwater species. Uh, we'll be working with colleagues on Hihi and Kaka, and also on Giant Waita as well with Thomas Buckley. So, and I'm clearly used to having 15 minutes. My, my sincere apologies. And there's a whole lot of people that are kind. So cheers, thank you. That, no, 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 it's necessary. Kia ora. Kia ora. That last slide, are those uh, native species? They are, yes. Oh, yeah. What, what sort of, um, what sort of uh, engagement have you done or consultation discussions um, with Māori? Yep. What have you engaged with? Yep. Can I, go, can I go back to that slide? I don't know if you'll let me go back. So I, I won't talk about each and every one, if that's okay. Can I talk yep, about that? Generally, the, it's good. Yeah, generally, yep. Yeah. So um, I talked a little bit about this yesterday um, in the panel. And so, for example, the, the um, challenge project that we've got, we actually developed that with Naitu Atiri. And the way that that was um, uh, developed was that I had a working relationship with the Runanga, and uh, Thomas Buckley approached me and said, hey, we're looking to do a, a, a project within the challenge, um, in the genomic space, in the adaptive variation space, what do you think we can do with this? And I said, well, I'll go talk to the Runanga. And so we actually co-developed um, the project using Canterbury mudfish, which is a tauna species. It's a, one of our most threatened freshwater fish species. And um, KY, or Waikora, KKY, there's a number of different dialects, obviously. Um, and, and, there's, and those are because those are two species, actually, that the Runanga actually identified as being of interest to them. And so, for me, that's the, the consultation, well, it's not a consultation, it's a co-development that I'm most proud of. Um, but others um, will have varying levels of consultation. So, um, so I can understand that for a, a species that's, um, that's uh, within the rohe of Kaitahu, but you have kiwi up there. So are you going to talk to every hapu about kiwi? I'm sorry, I talked very, very quickly. And these aren't, I'm not actually working on ki Kiwi. What I meant to say here was is that these are some of the projects that are either ongoing or soon to be ongoing in the conservation genomic space. These are not all projects that I'm necessarily involved in. And the, the North Island Brown Kiwi is not one of my projects. And my understanding at this space is in its early days. And so, and I, my understanding is that the project is in, North, is in Northland, and it, it will be in consultation with, um, uh, with the hapu and the iwi in Northland. But again, I don't know a ton about that one because it's not my project. This slide was more of an example to say that we are moving in this space, um, but I deeply appreciate the question. I've got one more, and then I'm, then I'm done. One more. Um, so I just, um, I understand what genomics is. Um, but I think that um, in terms of the agreements that you're formalising or should be formalising with Māori, that there can be a consideration about the um, ongoing intent of the project once the genomics is sourced or identified. And that that should be part of that initial discussion, not a discussion that says, let's work together to do this because genomics in itself is just a trace of the whakapapa or the genealogy of that thing. Um, but it's the intent of using that later on along along sides like um, responding to biosecurity incursion and uh, trading out different, different things within the genetic makeup of things so that you have a different species, so, or changes or adaptations to that species. And for Māori, that's an issue for us. So just a caution, really. But thank you very much. Yeah, no, and I, my, my, thank you very much because I agree with absolutely everything that you've just said, um, and I couldn't say it better myself, so thank you for that. Kia ora.